War Studies was founded 60 years ago, uh, around this very subject, I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about that tonight, but around the idea that history tells us something, and if we can learn from history and understand what has happened, uh, it will have an impact on warfare in the future and hopefully change and, uh, and prevent it from happening. Um, and War Studies, since that point when we had one lecturer in military history, has grown to a monstrous sized department of uh, 100 full-time academics, 1,600 students, uh, 14 MA programmes, lots of our students and staff and various other colleagues are here tonight. So um, I won't speak for any long, but it just really uh, it leaves me with you to thank everyone for coming, those of you here in the room, those of you online. Um, I hope you enjoy this and then thank you everyone who's been part of this last 12 months uh, of events, particularly Lizzie Ellen, who's been a really uh, strong person in organising everything. So I shall now pass over to uh, Dr. Jonathan Fennell, who is the co-director of the Sir Michael Howard Centre for the Study of War. And it's an exciting, yeah, it's an exciting evening for the Sir Michael Howard Centre as well. We have probably the biggest cohort of historians of war in Europe and maybe perhaps um, more widely globally. Um, and to have the, the speakers we have today is, is an honour and it's exciting. Um, I've been told I don't need to recount their CVs, but I think it's important to say we have alumni from the kind of cons core constituent compartments that make up the Sir Michael Howard Centre. So we've got Professor Beatrice Huizer representing or war studies effectively, Dr. Hugh Bennett, ex of defence studies, Professor Richard Obrey, ex of history, and of course, Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman, who we all know. And um, this is only my second time up in London in about two and a half years, so I can't, you know, the excitement of just being in a room together. And this is why we do this, right? This is why we do scholarly stuff to discuss, to share ideas, to disagree perhaps, to argue. So over to you, Sir Lawrence, and um, fire away. Thanks very much and uh, welcome to you all and, and welcome to those online. We haven't forgotten about you. Uh, hopefully we'll be taking your questions. Um, we decided our panel is gen is well known enough and you can find out about them because there's lots to talk about uh, and I, as I'm sure you are looking forward to hearing what they have to say. So the way we're going to do this is that uh, each of the members of the panel uh, are going to talk for seven to ten minutes. Uh, I will stop grunting or something if they start to go seriously over that. Um, then I, I will ask possibly a question or two, then the audience, but we'll be taking questions uh, from those watching online as well, because I know there are many of you. So uh, without further ado, as they say, I'm going to ask you uh, ben, just to get us started. Thank you very much. I um, hope you can all hear me if I stretch the microphone over. Uh, it's such an honour to be here today, and um, but my, my honour is mixed with horror at the, the scope and scale of the question that we've been presented with to, to talk about, because the answer, the only answer to this question, of course, is um, you better sit down because there's a lot. Uh, so <laughs> I've been selective in what I'm going to talk about. What I'm going to focus on today is uh, the role of domestic politics in warfare and in strategy. That's something that I'm gonna ask, argue history can teach us about the, the future of war. Before getting onto that though, I just want to reflect a little bit on the, uh, some of the problems of connecting uh, the future to the past. Of course, um, E.H. Carr, the, the noted historian, uh, reminded us that history is, is often normally written with ideas of the present in mind. You know, um, History is not just going back into the past and forgetting all about who we are today. It's about uh, being influenced by, by today's concerns, whether intentional or not. And that's particularly difficult for us at the moment. That makes history writing difficult for us at the moment when we're thinking about the present and the future, because we're living in a very unsettled present, obviously. So there's a, a great deal of dispute and, and confusion around what the present today means that makes it harder for us to uh, project onto the future. Traditionally, military historians have often been uh, influenced by debates going on within uh, the military profession, within uh, defence communities, within uh, defence ministries. That doesn't, of course, mean that they've always abided by those agendas. Relating to those debates doesn't mean conforming with those debates necessarily. 
but it does often imply a question of relevance. So a concern for being relevant. And that's difficult at the moment. If uh, you're like me and you've, you've just come out of working on a big historical project and you're kind of casting around seeing where the defense debate is at the moment and where it's been for the last few years, much of the defense debate in the UK and many other countries right now is uh, really in a kind of state of a, a, the shock of the new. A lot of this is about technology. A lot of it, of course, is about the changing wor world order. But there are many and repeated claims in the defense community that essentially imply that history can teach us nothing because we're in a new revolutionary age, whether that's because of drones or artificial intelligence or big data or something else in, in many different ways. But this is a challenge for historians if, uh, if everything is so novel and, uh, and revolutionary. One of the reactions that we can sometimes have to this unsettled present is that we can seek comfort in a settled past. And this has made it quite uh, tempting, and of course this is not something that all historians fall victim <coughs> to, but it does mean that there can be a tendency for searching out for morality tales uh, in, uh, in the history of warfare and in military history, instead of looking at troubling episodes. So searching for certainties, searching for reassurances and things that can uh, give us a positive feeling about national identity, for example. And um, I, I hope that, uh, that Richard might comment on that um, uh, assertion in relation to the writings on the Second World War, for example. Why is there so much writing on the Second World War? Why is there so little in comparative terms on decolonization in the UK? The Dutch uh, Parliament recently funded a major body of study into the Dutch war of decolonization in Indonesia, a huge team project with multiple different uh, aspects of it. And nothing of that on that scale has ever happened in the UK. Military historians in the UK have never engaged in that kind of activity. So why is that? Are we only looking for reassuring stories from the past and not for unsettling stories? Okay. Um, Having said all of that, I'm going to argue that this troubling history, which we also have, is a resource to be drawn upon, and it can tell us about not only the past uh, of the UK and of other, many other countries, uh, but also about the present and potentially uh, about the future as well, while accepting that there is a lot of uncertainty in that regard. So what I want to just briefly focus on before I get way beyond my seven minutes is uh, some continuities in British warfare and British strategy since 1945. And the, the, the aspects that I just want to emphasize in particular, and of course this is not an exclusive list, are uh, cross-party consensus amongst the major political parties, uh, a sense of uh, limited resources being available for defense or a limited liability. So the, the context of, um, uh, of the Cold War and then an enduring commitment to limiting the amount of the national resource that will go into defence, and connected to that, really an extension of that, um, an idea of there being normally higher priorities, that warfare and defence are not the only or the ultimate priorities of government. So I'm going to give you an example of this coming into practice in uh, contemporary British history, and argue that this can tell us something about the future, because these tendencies, these continuities uh, in British warfare and in British strategy, I think are still with us today and are likely to remain with us for the foreseeable future. The case study is something I've just written a book on, so I'll try not to get into an extended rant about my, about my book, but it's also something where, because of the recent electoral results, uh, the relevance of this case study may become more apparent in, in future years. I hope not. I'm talking about Northern Ireland. Now, the particular episode I'm going to just briefly explain is the strategy that changed in the British government's approach to the Northern Ireland conflict in late 1971 and early 1972. At the end of 1971, the British government had got itself into a position, uh, inadvertently at, at, at first and then deliberately, of attempting to destroy the Irish Republican Army as a precursor to having a political negotiation that would end the conflict. So in other words, they were pursuing a victory first strategy with a 
constitutional settlement would come after. From March 1972, the British government abandoned this and they went for simultaneous uh, use of military force alongside major political negotiations at the same time. So it's a very significant shift in the conduct of, of strategy in this, uh, in this conflict, which had very profound human consequences uh, as well. Now, traditionally, the explanation for this shift is very simple and it's very appealing emotionally as well. And the explanation is that Bloody Sunday happened and that there was a huge amount of public outrage at Bloody Sunday, and it provoked the British government to change course. What we can see from the archival record, however, is that it's more complicated than that, and there were many, many reasons for the change. But the one I want to emphasise is to do with the role of domestic politics in strategy and in conflict, because I think these things endure. Um, what was absolutely critical to this change of position was that the Labour opposition in the person of Harold Wilson uh, went from supporting war against the IRA, a, a victory first strategy, to changing tack and supporting negotiation. And it happened because uh, Harold Wilson had secret covert negotiations with the IRA leaderships on behalf of the Conservative Prime Minister, Edward Heath. And he conveyed the message back to Edward Heath at, uh, at a uh, Catholic cathedral uh, and a secret um, uh, conversation, the, 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 the official and the provisional IRA were offering negotiation or escalation. And part of their escalation implied and meant a bombing campaign in England, in London, and uh, other major English cities. And this is when the strategy changed because of that shift, not only in what the enemy were doing, but also because of this crucial party politics shift. The timing of it as well is important. It also shows this party political uh, uh, idea and this idea of higher priorities in politics, normally trumping defense and normally trumping warfare considerations, <coughs> was that the major change in policy only happened after Parliament had approved Edward Heath's bid to bring Britain into the European community. Once that crucial vote in Parliament had happened, on the 17th of February 1972, the Prime Minister was willing to devote political capital to fundamentally changing the game in Northern Ireland. He would not do it until that higher priority, the ultimate calling of his career as a Europeanist, had been satisfied. And I think this is uh, a lesson from history that is, is, has repeated itself since and is likely to be seen in the future in the context of limited wars that party politics and higher national interests will often outweigh what is the most logical and uh, self-interested strategy to pursue in purely military or, or strategic terms. Those higher national interests will, um, will, will take uh, precedence. So that's, that's my, my conclusion, if you like. Firstly, that uh, domestic, domestic politics is here to stay. It's been present for a long time in the UK as a factor in warfare. That's likely to endure into the future as well. And that secondly, we should turn more to our unsettling, uncomfortable, difficult past to look for those lessons from history and not only to the past that reassures us and tells us comforting morality tales uh, about who we are. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Beatrice. Very, very honoured to be here. Terribly nostalgic about my time here. We had a fantastic head of department. I'm not doubting that his successes were also wonderful, but it was a great time just to commemorate that. Um, I am going to leave aside some um, of these big questions of whether history does or does not repeat itself, whether history is cyclical, whether it always happens twice, once as a tragedy, once as a farce, uh, variously attributed to Karl Marx or to Hegel, or whether history stutters. I'll leave aside those, but I will show you some areas where there is continuity, there is that there are things that can be um, deduced from history in more, in more general terms. Um, not a, a case study that's a fascinating one, um, but I'll try to be slightly more general than that. First of all, in history, there are no ceteris paribus. You never have exactly the same situation again. And yet, there can be constants in a single human character. So you might find that there are people, are very important players, who are chronic liars, chronic megalomaniacs, chronic despots, chronic self-promoters, <laughs> chronic cowards. 
And yet you might also find that some important leaders change over time, change fundamentally, change their approach fundamentally. And I'm sure you can all think of examples for both. There are themes in national narratives that are of a very longue durée, that can be revived periodically. For example, our nation is destined by fate, by God, by history for greatness and glory, but has been prevented from doing so by wicked powers. And yet national narratives can change. See Sweden, Germany, Italy, in the last, say, 250 years. <laughs> Traditional animosities handed over from generation to generation. Um, we in Glasgow have orange marches even today. And even today, um, not to mention Northern Ireland, of course, where they, they actually come from, but we even have them in Glasgow. And from generation to generation, something is handed over there in terms of animosity and something that will continue to condition future war unless these marches end. Um, there are temptations to have an exaggerated view of one's own rights, power, influence once succeeding to higher office among clear player, key players that are very important in the context of war, along the lines of power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And there is this temptation of the abuse of power. And that seems to be a pattern that repeats itself over and over with people who come to very high positions of power. There are hard enduring constants, such as um, geography. Even that can change, though. Um, ports can, uh, rivers can silt up. Uh, ports can be suddenly be far away from our city. Port cities can be far away from the the uh, the, the actual uh, sea. Um, there are areas with and sustained uh, importance because of their natural resources, and yet technology may change the importance of these natural resources over time. So this again, something very important. If you look at what areas of Europe uh, wars have been fought over, you can say you know, the, the, the coal of the Ruhr or the industrial areas of Southern uh, Belgium, and all of a sudden coal is out. You know, so, so things like that can be on the one hand, uh, factors for war and conflict, or they can recede for new changes that have come about. You can say, I think, that similar political, organizational, economic, social configurations that produce similar interrelational dynamics exist. So, for example, there are parallels in decision making. I'm slightly psychic, strained away from war here, but still, I need to um, give you this example. There are parallels between the way in which the early Roman emperors of the Principate had to relate to their senates and the ways in which Tudor and Stuart monarchs related to their parliaments. So that there, there are power sharing structures that somehow um, result in similar conflicts, similar tensions over in different periods of time. Or think of, for example, the similarities of the effects of the Wall Street crash uh, of 1929 and the subprime financial crisis, and the, how that then played out gradually, one faster, one um, buffered by uh, social security as more slowly uh, into the impoverishment of sectors of population that then became um, drifted into political uh, areas of that uh, were dominated by, by populists. And there are times when you have, in now getting more directly to warfare, a toolkit of political, economic, propaganda, or military measures, all tools of strategy, that are applied to conflicts. For example, I conducted a study um, together with a lot of colleagues, a number of colleagues, on uh, insurgencies and counterinsurgencies and what tools they used. And interestingly enough, we found that in many different countries and many different parts of the world, different parts of history, the toolkit was similar. There were very few tools that were used by only one culture. Um, the kneecapping in Ireland <laughs> was actually one of the few exceptions. Um, but other than that, tools tended to be the same and even used by both by insurgents and counterinsurgents. And so you can have a continuity uh, from this point of view. You can see that this has been used in the past. And if you have a new uh, conflict like that, you might look out for similar things to happen. Um, the configuration of some key factors can be very similar in two different situations. Uh, what other key factors, uh, while other key factors will differ, the outcome may still be similar, albeit not identical examples. In intra-state wars, insurgents confronting a government in its state apparatus tend to be on the weaker side. So there are recurrent patterns here that do not apply every time, but can still apply quite a lot of times. This is a configuration that has been less affected by technological transformation than inter-state wars, we have argued. Um, then there is a pattern that we found in, in a number of um, counterinsurgency operations, particularly when there were foreign interventions, namely that uh, the foreign intervening force in the counterinsurgency tried to court some minorities which had structural reasons to be 
or against the government or, or against its owners or whatever, uh, but then abandoned them when the going got rough and they withdrew. So the Montagnard in, in, um, in Vietnam, um, the way in which the French are accused of having abandoned a lot of their the Haqqis, um, the abandonment of Kurds on the Iraqi Turkish border, etc. So there is a, there are little patterns like that that can repeat themselves in different situations. An historical situation, historical experience can also have something completely different, and that is a, they can be a counter influence, they can be a never again type thing that will weigh heavily on a new situation. So the never again uh, effect um, that uh, would ensure a particular knee jerk reaction in a new such context, for example, Western politicians thought Stalin would proceed in a similar fat fashion, apply salami tactics in the late 1940s to enlarge his uh, sway of power, as Hitler had done in the 1930s. Therefore, one would need to stop him early. A very crucial point, a very crucial thought that would repeat itself or that was expressed repeatedly in the early Cold War. This idea that uh, because we've made a mistake there, it has to be applied elsewhere. And that's very interesting because it's very simple human psychology also. Uh, I, uh, this, one shouldn't say this in polite company, but I will. Uh, there is a tendency of humans to take on out on your next lover, the damage done to your relationship and by a previous lover. So it's quite interesting how you say, you know, because this person betrayed me, I will now be very cautious with regard to this new relationship you know there's there, there are similarities there or uh, one of the lines that you heard over and over in a number of different crises which was britain must not appease dictators then variously applied to completely different situations whether appropriate or not so you can have this this counter um, example as well of something that uh, would then lead you to apply history in an almost predictable way but in a negative sense i will stop there rather than talking about ukraine perhaps we'll do that later Thank you very much, Beatrice. Um, Richard. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm going to talk a bit more generally, I think, but I'm going to start off with a little anecdote, and you'll see the purpose of it, I think. I once attended a conference in Harvard in 1980. It was funded by the CIA, though we were not told that. It was about intelligence and predicting war. Um, we all did our stuff for three days and at the end the director of the CIA came to tell us what he'd learned from our deliberations we've all historians here. and he said well he said I'm very sorry to say he said but I've learned nothing from these three days but at the moment we're working on gorilla glands and these are going to help us a lot in understanding why human beings wage war there wasn't much you could say to that <laughs> but it was quite clear that uh, there's a limit to what historians can tell practitioners uh, about the future of war. And in fact, when I was asked to, to do this, I, I, I was tempted to say, really, but there's nothing much you can say except that um, you know, we study past wars. We can perhaps predict something about what's going to happen in terms of technical development, tactical strategic development, and so on and so on. But at the end of the day, history is so unpredictable uh, unpredictable as we know, because in February when the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine began, very few historians had really imagined that that was going to be a, a possibility. And I think also when we consider the question, uh, what can the study of history tell us about future wars, there's a big temptation that, you know, to see us as predictors. I'm so often asked, as I'm sure we all are, I'm so often asked, when will World War III break out? Or will World War III break out? More often, obviously, in the last few weeks than, uh, than before. But there is no point of asking the story in that, because the processes, political, social, technical, and so on, which will contribute to the wars of the future, and there will be wars of the future, of course. One thing historians can say is that when you look after over the last 6,000 years, there's no doubt that we are looking at a bellicose species. Wars are not going to disappear. Um, but what shape they will take, uh, where the initiatives will uh, lie, um, where are the danger spots, well, we can, you know, we can all we can all do that, we can all double guess that. But I think it doesn't get as very far as the war in Ukraine uh, has already made very evident. Uh, in fact, I want to argue really that I think historians are the wrong people to ask. Uh, at the moment, in fact, I'm working on a, on a book about called Why War, which is about the various approaches that different disciplines have had, the human sciences have had to this question of the war, of war uh, and indeed its future. 
And I'm very struck that uh, there's almost no reference to historians because historians are regarded as, as people who will say something very particular about one war and know an awful lot about it. Um, but it doesn't mean that you will then be able to uh, influence you know, the, the way we think about future war. I've spent most of my career working on the Second World War, uh, and I do wish that uh, you know, those leaders willing to go to war in the course of the last half century uh, might have taken more note of it. But they don't. Um, and we don't, I think, because historians are, as I suggested, in a sense, I think the wrong people to ask. We know an awful lot about the past. We analyze it, explore it, etc. Uh, but ask us about the future. You know, we are not astrologers. And, um, you know, too many of the processes we're talking about are dynamic, understood better, perhaps, by other disciplines than by the discipline of history. I want to just start with, with one example where there is discussion, of course, about the prospect of future war, uh, and that's in climatology, uh, and in particular, of course, the, the current crisis of climate change. But linking climate and history together, which goes back roughly to the 1970s, when some pioneering work was first being done on uh, paleoclimatology and so on, trying to link that to the long history of human conflict. Uh, and it's arrived, I think, at some very interesting conclusions. Uh, these are, well, these are historians of climate, if you like, they're not historians in our conventional sense, and certainly not military historians. Um, but the research has shown uh, over the course of the last 2000 years, at least, that you can chart quite well a, a pattern between climate change and increased or decreased conflict. Um, it's obviously going to be climate change when there is uh, you know, a sudden and severe change. Uh, the so-called Little Ice Age in Europe, for example, um, studies have shown that the Little Ice Age uh, produced uh, a great many more conflicts than the period either before or immediately uh, afterwards. Or the uh, so-called medieval anomaly, which produced ex excessive um, high temperatures and drought across much of the world uh, between 800 and 11, 1200 uh, AD. Uh, and it's been shown very clearly in the United States that uh, the medieval anomaly produced widespread drought, uh, crisis, ecological crisis on a large scale, and an enormous increase in conflict, which can be shown by the archeological evidence, clearly shown by the archeological uh, evidence. But where does that leave us today, of course, because you know, since the 1990s, uh, climate conflicts have been one of the things that everybody's been talking about. Every security studies group thinks about what will the future of, uh, of climatic conflict be. And there are plenty of examples that people are able to point to, particularly in the Horn of Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Sudan, areas where there has been extreme weather variability, uh, which is closely correlated with an increase in levels of conflict. Uh, the same is true of so-called water wars. Uh, there's a great deal of work done, again, not by historians, uh, on the roughly 350 river, major river estuaries in the world uh, to show that arguments over water, which are going to get worse as climate changes, uh, is a potential for conflict. Uh, perhaps not in the short term, but in 10 years' time, 20 years' time. Um, there have been some scientific predictions to show very precisely, in fact, uh, how many conflicts you might expect uh, or what increase in conflict you might get. An increase of one degree centigrade in the world's temperature, according to one uh, geographer, uh, will result in 11% more conflicts. Now, these are, of course, actually not measurable at all. Um, but it's interesting that, that it's not historians, but it's um, uh, academics in other disciplines who are thinking about the 21st century and where we are likely to be finding conflict. Uh, and conflict driven by climate change, which has been evident uh, in many cases over the course of the last 2000 years. There's a great deal of work on, on, on China, in fact, in that relation, that because of excellent records for 2000 years, and there was a strong correlation between periods of uh, extreme weather variability 
uh, and conflict along the Chinese uh, nomad border in Central Asia. Where does this leave us, uh, where does this leave us uh, for the 21st century? I mean, almost everybody who writes about this now assumes that we will have water wars or climate wars of some kind uh, over the course of the 21st century. And the reference point is to look back over a, a very long uh, period of time, 2000 years, to show that there is a strong correlation uh, between increased conflict uh, and uh, dramatic change in climate. But you can see similar work being done by anthropologists or psychologists and so on, who again seem much better equipped to look at the way in which human societies have evolved and the extent to which human society, which, which kinds of human society or under what circumstances will those societies commit themselves to war. I think for historians, of course, there's a much more familiar ground. Um, you know, we tend to talk about power. We talk about security. Uh, we talk about resources, we talk about belief, whether we're talking about the Crusades or we're talking about ISIS. Uh, when we talk about power, we're talking about Alexander the Great, we're talking about Napoleon, we're talking about Putin, who is the last example of hubristic leadership. Um, waging war because he wants to wage war. There are purposes behind it, but he's waging war. There are plenty of other things he could have done, but waging war uh, is testament, I think, to his hubris. Resource wars. I think historians are much uh, more comfortable with resource wars because you can see plenty of those, certainly in the modern age, uh, 19th century onwards. Uh, many wars are, in fact, about access to resources. Uh, I'm always told off for saying that the Boer War was about access to gold, so I won't repeat that one. Um, but you know, here, here is one example through to the wars. Uh, uh, Italian, Japanese, and German wars of the 1930s, which were all about trying to engross more resources. Now, we haven't had resource wars of quite that kind, except for you know, conflicts over oil. Uh, now, again, with the Ukraine crisis, we have the issues over gas and oil all over again. I think historians are happier talking about things like that because they are much more familiar. Uh, I think also, if you know, we're thinking about climate change and conflict in the 21st century. We also need to talk about resources because climate or not, resources are finite. And in many cases, they're running out. And it is extremely hard to imagine that in a case like that, a severe uh, environmental crisis, and it's happened of course in the past, but for different reasons, it's hard to imagine that that is not gonna generate confrontational conflict of one kind or another. Now, as I said, I think, you know, saying how war will develop in the future is uh, something I think, you know, historians are a little bit hostage to fortune on that. But it also depends critically, and I think it's, it's already been touched on here, on issues of peace, of course. Um, not, you know, peace versus war, but we are in an age, of course, where there is a huge amount of uh, institutional uh, commitment to reducing the possibility of conflict. Now, some of the things I've just talked about, uh, arguments over river estuaries, have almost all been settled by international agreement and pressure brought perhaps by the United Nations or by others. But conflict in the Horn of Africa too. There, there are examples where uh, local tribes find ways of developing conflict resolution. So side by side with thinking now about you know, what can history tell us about the future of war? I think we need to, to grasp the other nettle and say, you know, what does history tell us about the prospects of peace? Are those prospects better now in the 21st century than they were 100 years ago? I think they almost certainly are, despite Putin. I think they almost certainly are. So these are two, I think, in a sense, two questions, they're sides of the same coin. That when we're talking about uh, the future of war in the 21st century, We've also got to think about the future of peacemaking and what that means um, and whether peacemaking uh, of a more extensive, broader, uh, on a more extensive, broader social base, not just peacemaking between states, but peacemaking at home uh, will become more and more characteristic of the century ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists for getting us off to such a, a good start now. Um, while you're starting to think of your questions, and I hope there'll be plenty, I'm going to start off um, with uh, a question of my own. 
and it, it's the starting point is um, well, it isn't from each of the three presentations. Uh, Richard ended uh, describing Putin's role and described it as hubristic, which is a maybe a generous interpretation, but certainly uh, it certainly fits. Um, you talked about the need to address troubling issues, um, you particularly mentioned decolonization, of course, of which Richard has written very extensively in his sort of a new and very influential reinterpretation of the Second World War. Beatrice talked, mentioned narratives, national narratives. Um, and I was thinking, given this is under the aegis of the Michael Howard Center, Michael's um, inaugural lectures uh, about at Oxford on, on was very skeptical about the lessons of history. But one of the things he talked about was a sense of the privilege we have in, in the West as historians of being able to challenge our national myths. Um, and I just want to, sort of, in a sense, consider what, what Michael was trying to challenge, part of what he's trying to challenge in that lecture, which is the role of historical myths in conflict. Um, so one of the explanations for what went wrong with Putin is not only the pandemic, which left him uh, far too isolated, um, but also he seemed to have had time to go to the library. Um, and you, you, you may recall that in, in July uh, 2021, he penned this long, um, this extraordinary historical essay um, about the origins of Russia, um, the, the, the relationship between Ukraine and, um, and Russia, with little Russia and great Russia. Um, Belarus had a place there too. Um, and if you, and maybe I just mentioned this sense of, um, uh, of the role of, of national myths, and by goodness, this was a national myth that was being developed. Um, so I'll just be interested, so, so it's not just a question of whether historians can throw light on, um, on how wars develop, but whether historians can be culpable uh, in all of this. Bad, bad history in particular, I'd be interested in, in Beatrice's is eager to come in on this. I mean, it, it just, it, what's striking is that when you're looking at the Russian debates, just, I mean, look at the way May the 9th, the role of May the 9th in this, the, the whole cult of the great patriotic war, um, the, the insistence on labeling Zelensky as Jewish and the comp as a Nazi and the complete mess they get into um, when it's pointed out that he is Jewish and uh, you know, even Putin had to, rec to, to rescue Lavrov from the sort of a, the, the Holocaust mythology he was getting into. It was interesting in your, in your thoughts on that role of history and conflict. Beatrice wants to come in. With a colleague at Reading, Athena Leusi, uh, we conducted a lot big project on stupid title, two volumes, a uh, pen and sword, um, famous battles and how they changed the world or something stupid. But what it's actually about is famous battles and their myths, how they were used politically um, in history, particularly, but not only since the 19th century, so since the great age of nationalism, in order to drive people to either uh, constantly think about uh, inherited enemies, hereditary enemies, uh, or somehow revive some animosity, or somehow revive some sense of sacrifice, collective sacrifice, loyalty to the nation, this, that, and the other. And no sooner had we finished this project that we began to realize that this is actually what is flourishing in Russia. It's not a historical thing at all. I mean, our two-volume thing is actually all about how you know, countries in the past did this, but it's actually alive and kicking, very much so. And in the, the Russian mythology, it's extraordinary just how all those big uh, selective narratives of uh, conflicts of the past, you know, they're being overrun by the Mongols and how the Russians were punished for the fact that they were not under one solitary, but rather authoritarian uh, leader, that they were, that what they needed in order to defend against this external enemy, the Mongols, and then afterwards the wicked Polish-Lithuanian empire, the Teutonic Knights, whatever it was, that they needed this strong leader to see them through, just to, to bring them all together. And that being divided, 
and too democratic, if you like, um, was always a great, great problem there. Um, or that everybody always had it in for them, that they are the country that is the victim country. Um, when, uh, if you look at the map of Russia today, you sort of think it's difficult to imagine that they feel that they're always being conquered by others. Um, and yes, you can see how that was be the, the, the effect uh, the, 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 uh, on the rebound to having been occupied and conquered or invaded by other countries. They wanted to have lots and lots of buffer area. Having said that, they ended up with the largest time zone country in the world. Um, so it's quite amazing how this narrative is very, very much there. If you ever get to Moscow, my goodness, go to this fantastic museum. Um, Russia, my history. Uh, Russia, my history. This fantastic museum that they've built, which is all about um, the great battles of Russian past uh, portrayed in, in colors, which you get from icons. It's all sort of gold and black and actually artificial candles in front of them where you see all these heroes of the various Russian battles of how they've suffered. And it's a terrible Christian myth because it's all by suffering they have been, they've, uh, they have merited uh, a, a salvation in the end. You know, it's this terribly sort of a Christ, Christian or whatever myth that is constantly being played upon and how immensely uh, uh, alive this is. And the 9th of May is, is all about this. Instead of doing what we've done, which has been mourning for individuals, mourning for people that we knew in our families, anything like that, uh, and, and commemorating individuals and trying to home in on individual uh, fates, um, it's this collective thing about how collectively, and just look at the, the, the war graves they have where you hardly have any names. It's it's always the collectivity who try to forget the grief in the glorying in that collective sacrifice that merits for you the great place in the world history. Uh, and that is so alive and kicking. We see it in the conflict now in every possible way. Sorry. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to, my, my interpretation of, uh, of the question is, is how far we can get away from myths and, and when do we, escape from them and when don't we? Um, and I think um, to go back to what I was saying earlier, in my view, it's it's when we're in a crisis in the present and it's when the myths no longer work. You know, the myths are supposed to do something. They're supposed to explain the world and, and big events that are taking place. And sometimes they just don't make sense anymore. And, um, you know, to react to something that um that was being said at the beginning about about kings when i started my career as an academic i worked in the defense studies department and this was um when things were going wrong in iraq um and the mythology that had existed for a few decades about the british army and counterinsurgency was that the british army had kind of solved the essential conundrum of how you tackle insurgencies that uh, the British were very humane and used minimum force, and they were uniquely good at dealing with this type of conflict. And then Iraq came along and it just didn't make any sense anymore. So there was a lot of myth busting at that time. Um, and I think a, a great kind of phrase for this, something I came across looking at um, debates in the Ministry of Defence on official history in the 1970s, when they were thinking, should we have an official history of Northern Ireland or, or not? And the answer was not, with capital letters. Um, but the phrase came up with this beautiful piece of sort of civil service uh, um, writing, the idea of the dirty laundry, and that people in defence and people in the military you know, are concerned about exposing their dirty laundry and about being open to criticism because careers were at risk. This is a very difficult thing to people for people to do to reflect on on the recent past. Now, of course, what Sir Lawrence Friedman did was participate and play a leading role in the Iraq inquiry, which was the major example of dirty laundry in the UK and defence history in the last 20 or 30 years. Right. But what's so interesting about that, I think, is that the Iraq inquiry can perhaps stand out as unique. This is not the, it did not become the new normal of how defence and the military and war is scrutinised and discussed in the United Kingdom. It, it's been left. And in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of concern about criticism within defence and between uh, the military and civilians actually being on the decline and about taboos re-emerging. So we may be back into the, the myth territory and away from the, the, the myth-breaking era. Interesting. Richard? Uh, well, I just add a, a, a little bit. Um, I mean, I think that that obviously, you know, all countries develop their own national narratives, and they don't, you know, myth, myths or not, they don't necessarily lead to conflict. So they're not quite the same thing. I think in the Russian case, uh, I mean, it's clear it, it is important for Putin, but there are other sources of resentment too. I mean, I I think that in the case of 
of Ukraine, irredentism is a very important issue, as it was for uh, on numerous occasions in the 20th century too. Um, myths can then be mobilized, and they are mobilized, of course, when it's necessary to mobilize them. I think they don't ipso facto uh, lead to conflict. I think more dangerous thing is to is to recognize when a leader of a major power. Um, in other words, a power capable of destabilizing the system, as Russia is doing, uh, harbors resentments, um, which are backed by an increasingly irrational rhetoric. Uh, uh, and now, we, we all could see that with Putin from 2014, and more perhaps should have been done, um, uh, either, you know, either to appease, placate, or oppose. Um, but it, it does seem to be that it's, the national narrative is then mobilized you know, deliberately in this case to justify what it is that he's doing, but national narratives don't necessarily do that. Um, there are plenty of national narratives, but there are also plenty of places where conflict takes place in the world uh, where you know, there's not a particularly secure national narrative, but there certainly are conflicts in the world which are fueled by you know, resentment, irredentism, uh, ethnocentrism, and so on. Um, and uh, you know this you know i suppose if historians can focus on anything these are the sorts of things they can focus on because there is a long history of them now in the 20th century um but you know whether we uh, can assume that these are the drivers of future conflicts i think it's uh, it's a much more problematic issue now, two people have already caught my eye are there any other questions at the back there so john gearson <laughs> Um, there's a microphone. We have roving microphones. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I was just, well, I've got to be careful because Hugh and I are working on a very similar subject area and so we can just have a seminar together. Um, I was going to say, you know, narratives changing. It's only taken 75 years for people to celebrate Germany increasing defence spending uh, rather than not. And, you know, we, we, we've had this sort of, uh, this, 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 you know, there's this nervous breakdown about this over 30 years, but, but but now it's been celebrated. And let's remember the German narrative is not a West German narrative. It's an East and West German narrative that's led to where they are today. So I think, um, I think history does tell us something about narratives. But I was going to say, and again, Hugh stole my thunder, but I was going to say, you know, Michael Howard's initiation has led to war studies from which came defense studies, which is within our school now, um, where there are lots of military historians and there's lots of history being done. And when I spent some time uh, teach, teaching there, um, as, as Hugh did and others, um, a lot of today's military going through our staff colleges are studying history very carefully. And, they are, and they're not just sucking up narratives. They're analyzing the decision-making and, and, how, and how their predecessors did things. And they do think about the future. Um, and I suppose what troubles me 35 years into, into doing this is um, why hasn't that worked? Um, and it seems to me, first of all, people take the lessons they want to when they are faced with the next challenge as it, as it comes. But there must be something else about how, paraphrasing back to uh, domestic politics or even Clausewitz, we revert to politics ultimately. There is something wrong between the professional military class, their understanding of the past, and decision making when politicians say they want to use a military instrument. Um, at which point it seems that there, there are people who are then willing to, usually under pressure, offer quick solutions and then repeat, I'm going to say it now, repeat the mistakes of the past. And Hugh and Beatrice both talked about counterinsurgency quite a lot. And it's a dismal tale of the same failed techniques being used sometimes by militaries, but also, crucially, almost always the failure of strategy to guide what is done on, on, the, on these long and, div and divisive uh, campaigns. So I do think that says something about the future of warfare for us in, in looking at it, which is that they're probably going to be very much the same because the people who don't look at the future of warfare other than I would say two to 300 years ago is our political class. They, they tend not to want to look at that difficult, maybe that difficult post-colonial period or, or, or even some of those lessons. Um, and in the pursuit of, of objectives, which are usually domestically driven, I'd agree with you on that, they want solutions. And if somebody offers them solutions, they often seem to take them. Thanks. Yeah, I take that as an observation rather than a question. Um, but we... no, I'd say two, two minutes, please. 
I, know, I, I, I and I wish to park it there we can, and take uh, Mike Goodman next and then a question at the back of, and then we'll ask the panel to comment. Mike. And then... Thanks very much. <clears throat> uh, it's a sort of question on the question, you know, what, what does history teach us? In a week where we've had the rough results and history and politics here has done well and impact has done well. You know, we are, I think, academics in war studies that don't preach from the ivory tower. We like to mix with practitioners. But of course, the problem is you can come up with the best forms of history and you can come up with the best lessons. Does anyone ever listen? So it's a question, I think, for lots of, you know, for all of you, even for Laurie, you know, we have had an official history programme in this country for a very long time, which was closed down. Lots of the government departments have lost their historians. The Foreign Office still have them and still do that very well, but they're the exception rather than the norm. So actually, is this really a question not about historians writing and learning from history, but trying to persuade those who actually should be doing something about it to learn from history? And at the back there, then I've got a couple after it. Right at the back. Uh, say who you are as well, if you don't mind. Hi, can you, yeah. Uh, my name's Sam. I work in financial services. Thank you very much for giving up your time to come and speak to us today. Um, I have uh, two questions. First was on the initial remark about uh, the study of war. The purpose of it is to prevent war. Um, do you think that also the study of war is to uh, do better next time? And, and secondly, one of the themes that you've discussed is uh, myth and domestic politics as being really crucial. Um, do you think that um, in a situation where a nation state doesn't potentially have a myth, that, it's, uh, that it loses that sort of um, cordus spirit in, in a domestic sense, that it, that it would perform worse or, or is susceptible to conflict? Thanks. Thank you very much. So question two, including the question of does anybody take any notice uh, when they do their history? Um, <coughs> Richard, why don't you start this time? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I would certainly not make any case to say that the military don't study history. They do study it a lot. And I've been, as we all have, um, to many uh, military colleges here and in the United States where, you know, they're fascinated and informed about history. But I still think that's, a, you know, it, it, it's limited what that will actually tell them about the kind of war that they're going to be fighting. Um, and, you know, we could have gone and lectured a lot in the 1980s about uh, the history of warfare in Europe in the, um, in the 20th century. But, uh, you know, they were faced with the Iraq war uh, and a very different set of circumstances. I think the problem for the military is that you can't predict the circumstances circumstances. And coming back to what you're saying about the politicians, of course, um, but, you know, we're not talking about the history lessons of the military, we're talking about history lessons of everybody. And, and politicians are very bad at taking history lessons, or, or, or they want to take the lessons that they want to take. And, um, but since 1945, um, you know, Ukraine apart. I mean, there have been very few uh, serious interstate conflicts, um, and you know, politicians might huff and puff and want to do something. The military might be straining at the leash and so on. But in fact, the wars that they actually fight are relatively simple wars. Um, in uh, you know, the two Gulf Wars, um, uh, well, I consider Vietnam War is not in fact a simple war at all. Um, but they're but they're no, they're not wars that you know do the same thing as the First and the Second World War. Um, and, um, you know, politicians and soldiers alike are obviously, you know, committed to avoiding that problem. And, you know, the issue for Putin is, is different. You know, he did need an historian sitting with him in the Kremlin. He did need to talk to people to take some advice about, you know, you know what's the best way to pursue a, a set of strategic goals that I've got. Um, you know, tell me how to do it. Nobody did. So in the end, he says, you know, the only way I'm going to do it is to, is to go to war. And this is a political decision, you know, not a military decision. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, it's just in response to, to John's question, I mean, I think one of the greatest kind of intellectual problems for um, the military and for uh, civilian leaders uh, strategically, is, of course, is knowing what is relevant, what is the relevant history, uh, and when should it be kind of engaged and acted upon, and when is the environment completely novel? To go to, to um, Beatrice's uh, point as well, of course, about repetition and, and cycles in history. So 
from the Northern Ireland case, you know, very clear that one of the most disastrous policy decisions to introduce internment without trial, the military advice was almost unanimous that it should not be done because there was clear historical understanding of what was likely to happen as a result, which did happen. The politicians were warned, they were told about the history, um, but they were thinking in political terms. There were no better options that they could find and they were impatient for results to get the problem dealt with uh, as soon as possible and to move on um, to the next things. So I think that th there is certainly a limit to how much historical understanding and awareness by the military profession can actually have any effect um, uh, at a strategic um, level. Having said that, I do think there are areas of um, military practice that are politically difficult, um, especially, for example, inter-service rivalry. This question of why does somebody always offer a solution? Why, um, as uh, the Iraq, Iraq inquiry uh, unveiled, why did the Ministry of Defence and, and senior leaders in the Ministry of Defence advise that defence planning assumptions be breached and that Afghanistan, the deployment into Helmand, go ahead uh, against all the planning assumptions? It's because perhaps of rivalry and ambition and the politics of the services. So I think it's very largely to do with this uh, civilian le leadership uh, um, ignorance and operating to political timetables, but there's also the politics within the military that does um, come into play too. Um, thankfully, you've said about the military and strategy making what I was going to say, though, so I don't need to repeat it. Uh, just to summarise and to say, um, military don't make political strategy, it's the politicians who make it, and the military who plays with it, and then mm -hmm. adapt it to their own careers and ambitions and all the rest of it, and their own genders, etc. Yeah. Um, a country without identity narrative, can that do well? well? Um, it's absolutely fascinating to see a very recent countries and how they struggle with this and very often, of course, do it, disintegrate into civil war and things like that because there are conflicting narratives. Um, so I've learned a tiny bit about Liberia in the recent past, which is a fascinating a case study. I will bore you with it, but it's just about a country that is finding it very difficult to have a, a national narrative in which its civil wars are suppressed and uh, in which there's some sort of tradition of liberty and, and, and alliance with the United States, which becomes part of the nationalism. It's, it's very, and it's very fragile. So I do think that there, you have a point there that it might be very difficult. Um, do, uh, is war studies about trying to prevent war or to do better next time? I think both, um, but not uh, the preventing war at absolutely every cost. I mean, this is the lesson from 1939, 1938-39. Uh, and the other one, do better, define better. And what is very interesting there is that, uh, you know, among the multiplicity of, of definitions, um, one very interesting one is actually one that comes, uh, goes back to a, a Russian strategist I've learned more about due to a PhD student of mine, um, which is to say to try to achieve one's political goals with as few losses as possible. Uh, and I think that's a sort of fairly um, consensus building uh, idea, you know, the idea that you're trying to do this without uh, uh, too much bloodshed. And if you are going to go to war and you think that uh, the cause is just trying to do it without having too many horrible victims, uh, uh, sorry, losses and victims, etc. Um, so that would be my attempt to say that. answer that. Now I've got lots of questions around now, um, but I've also got some from our online audience uh, and... Uh, I'm going to quickly mention those because they have a right to be heard. Um, so three quick ones. Um, they're, they're, they've got names attached to them, so I'll, um, I'll put them in, but I think all of you may want to answer them. First for Hugh, uh, why does the study of military history become so emotional? And if our understanding of warfare is so emotionally charged, can we really learn from it? For Beatrice, and I know what's going to happen with this question, if history is useful due to the fact that we can identify patterns, are we better using the more quantitative approaches of the social and political scientists uh, when trying to understand the role of history in understanding the future? And then for Richard, um, many historians argue that there are no patterns, but that is a lesson in itself. Practitioners, therefore, can, one can argue, cannot learn set approaches to the problem of war there must be imaginative and analytical, evaluative, reflective practitioners. So to develop those skills, is it advisable, necessary to study history? So one question each. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I don't think the study of war does have to be emotional. There's a long tradition of the study of war not being emotional. Um, to a certain extent, it's a, it's a matter of personality and, and style. Uh, I'm a Welshman, I'm quite emotional, and that's who I am. So it comes out in my speech and in my writing. And, you know, you can, you can take it or leave it, and some people find it very objectionable. <laughs> objectionable. On the other hand, war is uh, about suffering, and war is about loss and, and destruction. So to me, personally, it seems odd to pretend that it doesn't involve emotion. Um, the historical discipline in the last few decades, of course, has become quite adept at the study of emotions, uh, emotions in politics, emotions in political cultures, in, in all sorts of different contexts. Um, there's increasing study of the emotions of soldiers and uh, of the military profession. So I think there's, um, there's a lot to be gained from uh, bringing emotion into the study of war. Well, I'm not quite sure I heard the question properly. I'm uh, sorry. It's basically, if you need all these evaluative uh, skills, uh, what um, do you need history? The study, does the history of, uh, study of history help you develop the skills necessary to be a good policymaker? I think that's <laughs> roughly what it comes down to. Well, we would like to think so. Um, <laughs> we'd like to think, uh, we would like to think that we've trained many policymakers over the course of the last decades um, and they've gone away and, and made better policy. I think it's actually very difficult to, uh, to answer that question. Um, I mean, clearly we think that the, the things we do as Western historians in terms of evaluating evidence, uh, disposing of myths, um, revising what seem to be comfortable truths and so on, is what we do as historians. Uh, I, I think many people who go out into the wider world after hearing us do that at university uh, would, would you know, think perhaps it's a good idea to apply these lessons to the way in which they make policy, but whether they are able to do so, of course, is, a, is another matter altogether. Um, I mean, we do like to think that that's what teaching history does, and we don't want to be disillusioned by it, uh, but I think it has its limitations. My question was qual or quant? <laughs> Is it better to go about it qualitatively or quantitatively? Quantitative uh, studies tend to focus on one dimension, one aspect. And as Clausewitz himself said, there is a number of variables in warfare is so large that they could baffle even a Newton. And Newton was his great ideal. Um, may I just uh, read out to you a very short definition uh, of a uh, point by Genrik Antonovich Leir, uh, 1829 to 1904, a Russian um, imperialist, imperial um, strategist who said, a very Clausewitzian, um, there are no laws or rules that suit every possible occasion, because the number of possible occasions is infinite. Therefore, each law should be seen as a formula in which situation, time, and occasion is a variable that should be inserted to get a specific solution to every known occasion. So that means that basically you can't simply calculate on in one dimension what's going to happen in one particular uh, case. And therefore, I think you get an, an element of um, a qualitative analysis that has to bring together in a judgmental way, lots of different variables, which you can't quantify entirely, where you have to make an, an, a considered judgment of saying this weighs very heavily, that weighs very heavily, without, and I totally agree with uh, Richard Overy on this one, being able utterly to predict what's going to happen, but to point out possible developments given the um, interplay of these different variables, and to point out what could, what different things could happen in the future uh, in the judgment, which has to be qualitative in the knowledge of all these different dimensions. Thank you. Now, I'm, I'm aware of questions there, there, and there, and I know there were others, some there too. Let, let me take those three first, and, there, and then I'll, I'll take some more. So, very patient, you've been there. Um, my question is more specifically about um, Dr. Overy's point about um, like the importance of um, politics in regards to decision making when it comes to warfare. And I was just wondering about, do you think that the, um, the fallout from the Iraq war and the Afghanistan wars will have an, a long lasting impact, if it has an impact at all, upon decision making in the future of British um, like invasions and acts of war? Then you've got the microphone in. Hello? Yeah. Um, I used to be a soldier and also a member of parliament. 
And I can tell you that what you are doing is hugely important. And by you, I mean people who have the time to think deeply about history and particularly about military history. Because when a, a politician needs to make a decision, there's one thing he does not have, and that is time. He needs to be able to turn to a body of uh, academics uh, and also well-educated soldiers, sailors, and airmen, as Margaret Thatcher had to do, of course, at the beginning of the Falklands War. Uh, and those people need to be able to give the political decision maker a series of well-thought-out options within which he or she can choose. That's that, and then bring the microphone around here. Alice Hastings Bass, I'm a master's student here at King's. So we're obviously in a time of great technological change with cyber warfare, IA arguably making warfare more distant, less hum human. How can history help us when all the tools are so new? Okay, so three rather brief questions, but very pointed. So very brief you, you, yeah. Yeah. Um, when we did our very big study on counterinsurgency in the insurgency, we found the technology had less of an impact there than in interstate war, uh, very simply because very often, not always, but very often you find that the insurgents um, are on the very weak side of a spectrum of what arms they, uh, they have and what means they have, which means they have to resort to ruses and to all sorts of things that are fairly old fashioned and are, are, are have been there for, for a long, very long time. So there are pockets at least uh, where you can see that things happen over a very long time and, and because uh, are, um, uh, uh, where there's a continuity. And another thing where there's a continuity is with despite everything else is human nature. Uh, so there are all sorts of human proclivities, but also human inabilities to decide faster than a certain, at a certain speed. Uh, you can augment that with uh, artificial intelligence, but the human still has to somehow have that time to reflect something and take decisions. So there are some elements where you do actually have continuity despite the new technology, I think. Um, thank you. I'll just um, answer the question about Iraq and Afghanistan because that's the one where I have the strongest opinions. Um, I'm very, uh, I'm a very impatient person myself. I'd like to know the answers now. Really, I'd like to know a lot more about what happened in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And most of the evidence is not available to the public. What we do have is what the Iraq inquiry produced, which is incredibly valuable. But in terms of the actual operational kind of conduct of those wars, the, most people can't find out what was going on. But there's a counter argument to that where, which might be stronger, which is to say that some historical, some, some distance, some time might help us. Because if you look at the debate on Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, it get, kind of goes in two directions. Either people want to forget all about it and move on to what's happening now with Russia and China. And that's the, the dominant tendency, I think, in, in defense and in the military. Or people are very um, in, engaged in very rancorous, acrimonious debate about whose fault it was and why did President Biden decide on the withdrawal and, and so on. And it becomes very bitter. And there's not much to be learned from that. So I think in that, in, in that particular case, we might need and benefit from from more distance and from it becoming more historical. Uh, just be, I mean, a, a, a quick comment. Um, I comment about having to make decisions quickly, of course, yes. I mean, it, it, it depends. Sometimes, of course, war is contemplated for quite some time before it's uh, decided on Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. It two years of worrying, thinking, arguing, discussing before it was actually launched. Uh, on other occasions, of course, you have to launch a war very quickly and you have you know, to decide whether to do it or not, in fact, and whether it's a possibility or whether it's not. And the Falklands, obviously, is a good example of that. I mean, you know, all the circumstances of, of each of these crises vary a great deal, which is what makes it difficult, coming back to what I was saying at the beginning, what makes it difficult for historians to be able to provide an analysis which uh, makes sufficient sense, because we're talking about such a wide variety of, of different kinds of war. We're talking about such a wide variety of uh, regions, areas, and conflicts. We're talking about such a wide variety of motives, um, so that you know, double guessing what kind of wars will become characteristic for the 21st century, I think, is much more difficult. We talked about counter insurgency, and counter insurgency is clearly um, you know, something which is not going to to go away. Um, we thought interstate war had gone away. All that discussion in the 1990s about is war obsolete and people patting themselves on the back and saying it probably is. Of course, it's not obsolete. Um, 
But you know, what direction it's going to take in the course of the next 30, 40 or 50 years um, it, it is something you can, uh, I mean, you know, the one certainty that we have is that war has a future, but precisely what that future is, I think, is difficult for us to detect. So I'm watching the time. We, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, one there. Let, let, oh, two. two uh, let's start sound with them behind and then right at the, right the back. And that should be all we've got time for. Sorry. Um, oh, you first. Okay, then. Um, it's part of the challenge of history that you're looking for cause and effect to get lessons, but Paul Alexander, by the way, um, challenge of history to get cause and effect to get lessons, which you then use to apply and predict. And in the example that Hugh gave, um, it, you then have the challenge of EU membership and explaining the relationship between that and a change for Ireland from victory to negotiate. And how do you find a way to be able to learn anything from that? And it's part of the challenge that you don't have rational interests, where they're rational to them in that moment. But it doesn't provide you with enough to create cause and effect that you can then apply elsewhere. And is that really then a historical challenge? How do you then be able to get into the world of those decision making sufficiently to be able to um, extrapolate lessons that can then be used in a richer and better way going forward? Okay. Um, thanks very much. And uh, a, a comment and a question, a comment in response to Richard's uh, uh, statement that um, history is not very much uh, very useful for the future of warfare. And, you know, we use these structured analytical techniques and scenario mapping to try and look into the future. But actually, at the end of the day, history is the only data source we have um, to construct those future scenarios. And um, uh, so it is it remains incredibly useful i'm going to ask a really boring question which i hoped you would have answered already but how do you see the future of this war the one that we what does history tell us about how this war proceeds and ends and what we in hmg should be doing about it <laughs> i may do that one well uh, um, uh, well there's, there's, there's at the back there all right and a desperate person over there. Um, uh, ah, at the top there. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Jude, and um, the lady over there sort of beat me to the punch. So <laughs> I'll try to restructure this question. Um, as sort of uh, warfare uh, becomes more digitalized, you know, in the 21st century, uh, do you think there will be some sort of correlation? between that and like sort of how it progresses. Um, so like, as we see, you know, right now, like as we speak, um, the Ukrainian conflict, you see all this misinformation and fake news spreading on the internet. And uh, even just before with the uh, Taliban occupation of Afghanistan, you really see how it, it feels more like, um, uh, politics and the internet has become sort of homogenous and um, how it, it's really become a game of pointing fingers at each other between political groups online. So, uh, so basically what I'm saying, what I'm asking is uh, with your knowledge, do you think that would sort of, uh, as time progresses, you know, in the years to come, that sort of escalate, that have a big say in proxy wars and the like. Thanks very much. We are under very great time pressure, so people will just have to excuse me. Uh, 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 maybe you can grab the speakers quickly afterwards. I'm going to ask them very quickly, one, one minute answers each. Hugh, Richard, or Hugh, you start. Yeah. Hugh. Uh, thank you. Um, in terms of uh, rational decision making, Paul, absolutely. I mean, if we want to understand what was in Edward Heath's head, you know, there is a question about how valuable that is for, for anyone looking to the present or the future. 
Um, I think you know some of those particular circumstances will not repeat themselves go, going into the to the EEC and so on. But the the broader institutional point about domestic politics and its interrelation with strategy, I think that that generalizable point can be taken out. It really goes to the difference between uh, me and Richard, apart from his immense intellectual stature and my sort of diminutive one, which is that he, he's he's more the purist historian. I think purist historians would argue that there are very great limits to any lessons that could be drawn out. But a lot of people who study war uh, are more at the intersection between strategic studies uh, and, and history and are not quite certain which camp they sit in and would argue that, that lessons that can come out. On the internet and the digital age and, and misinformation, it's, it's the debate now about what changes people's opinions and will it actually ever force them to change their behaviour in a conflict is so resonant of the debate in the 1950s about communist propaganda, the early Cold War, misinformation, NASA's propaganda campaign against the British in the Middle East and so on. It's, it's all been talked about before in slightly different terms. So there are elements of... Uh, repetition here as, as Beatrice was discussing. Richard? Uh, well, just a couple of things to, to add. Um, I mean, we're talking about historians, but of course, many of the people who do talk about the future of war are, are in strategic studies or in international relations, um, or indeed, uh, as I was talking in my, my remarks, you know, doing uh, climatological history and doing it very well. Um, there are sociologists and political scientists um, who are capable of using a quantitative assessment of uh, past conflicts, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, um, and uh, able to, to make predictions that look much more robust, I'm afraid, than the predictions that might be made by historians. But I think one of the problems about history, of course, is that we are, or historians, you know, we historians here, is we're a very rational bunch. Um, and uh, you know what we try and impose on our history is a kind of rationality, um, and yet the people that we're dealing with, you know, Putin or whatever, or indeed the, the the conflict leaders for the next thirty years, you know, the chances are that they're going to have a very different kind of rationality from ours. They're going to have a very different set of justifications. They're going to have norms and values and uh, um, attitudes which we as rational Western historians will find difficult to engage with you know i mean we don't understand or we don't empathize particularly with with the way in which the taliban thinks about the world but the taliban is now triumphed in afghanistan um i mean not only do i think there are limits to what historians can do but i think there are limits to the way we can understand conflict not just in europe or conflict generated by the united states for example but conflicts in all those other parts of the world where conflict actually does take place in the middle east in africa uh, in you know uh, southeast asia in you know on, on the indian frontier and so on there, there are plenty of areas of conflict which we hardly embrace i think as historians the way in which we think about the future of all but in fact this is where this is where we're going to find warfare in the next 20 or 30 years um, whether it's motivated by you know, irrational drives, resentments, you know, frontier arguments, or indeed, uh, you know, failing climate. Um, and I, I think that, that we need, perhaps as historians, we need to have a, actually a, a greater measure of humility when we approach this question. Very briefly, we've all dodged the, the uh, question about how the Ukraine war is going to develop. Uh, I shall dodge it as well, but um, there are other sorts of predictions one can make. One can say that this is clearly a net national identity crystallizing war for Ukraine. So you can see that um, it has crystallized in an extremely fast time uh, loyalty to a particular political identity, which before that might have been more contested. Um, you can you can do things like that. You can see, you can see that there are uh, more uh, such outcomes. Or you know, the, um, I'm still a bit skeptical about the the um, watershed in in German thinking. There, I just I, I can't resist the temptation to share with you my favorite tweet on the subject, which is just for the record, you want us to rearm, march across Poland, defend <laughs> Polish, possibly even invade Russian territory, all in defense of Ukraine. You know, um, just for the Record. Um, the, uh, but uh, uh, I'm a bit skeptical that that's going to be a very big thing. But at some stage, there is going to be some crystallization there as well of something else, um, you know, where people will finally realize that it is not true that we have all lived in peace since 1945, but that there have been wars in the world. You know, this is a peculiar Central European view that I've encountered many times over the years, including by historians of the Military History Research Institute of the Bundeswehr, who told me, you know, we have lived in peace. The world has been in peace since 1945. 
Okay, um, but um, quite, uh, just just very last point on the the um, uh, your skepticism about uh, or the humility of historians. Um, one of the things that history does teach us is that people see the world very differently from us because we're confronted with this all the time. Um, I have enormous difficulties understanding how thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of peoples could become monks and nuns in the Middle Ages. Yeah, and this is our own civilization from which we've descended. Uh, and yet for them, this was a very reasonable thing to do um, or something that in some way was inspired and right. Um, just to, to understand that people think very differently is easier for an ethnologist and an historian, I think, than for a political scientist on the whole. Thank you. Um, I'm going to make two observations on the Ukraine thing. First, the importance of historical method. Um, we deal with evidence, and it goes to the fake news, fake information question. Um, you can apply rules of evidence and corroboration. Um, you can be skeptical, claims all around, and I think that's helpful. Secondly, it's really been interesting that if you look at the debates going on about the course of the um, of the Ukraine war, that historians um, have been very active in this debate and much more uh, pessimistic on the Russian behalf than others. The analysts look at the numbers and so on. The historians look what happens to military organizations with poor morale, whose logistics are suffering, and so on. So people like Elliot Cohen and Phillips O'Brien uh, have been very active in this debate and very um, uh, uh, and won't make for good reading in, in Moscow. Whereas the more uh, political science or analytical side uh, is much more cautious about how things will develop. And just a final point, given that the Iraq inquiry was mentioned, it was also about accountability. And historians do have have a sort of role in that. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, just going to the point about uh, dirty laundry, I was very struck in the middle of the inquiry, going to uh, Shrivenham and talking to people, to, to officers there, how anxious they were that, it, that, that, that the dirty laundry came out because they felt quite annoyed about the experience they'd had because of, of poor decisions. So um, whether it has any lasting benefit is, is a different question. But if you've been through something like that, I mean, I hate the word closure, but, but, but there's, there's some sense that the, the people have noticed what happened um, and held others to account. With that, I want to thank enormously our panel and also our audience, and our, including our online audience, for what has been a really rich interesting and varied discussion. So join me in thanking the panel.